Right, hello everyone. Um, my name's Hazel. I'm going to be chairing this afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone for coming along. Meeting this afternoon is fighting for jobs, homes and welfare amid multiple crises. We've got two speakers this afternoon, Will Searby and then Willie Black. And then we've got a third speaker who we're going to bring in later, Kate. Um, each speaker is going to speak between 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll open up for some general discussion and as I say later we'll bring in a third speaker. I will um, first introduce our first speaker today who's Will. Will is a member of East London RS21 and he's been organising around redundancies in his workplace and he became a Unite Union rep. So yeah I've been asked to speak about kind of the multiple crises um, which are kind of imposed on us by the context of the pandemic and that's you know both the fight for safe workplaces but also organizing around redundancies um, and in many cases it's just kind of product of what we already know um, that in any crisis the ruling class will always try to shift the costs onto us um, but initially this kind of opposition seems like a dilemma it seems like as we saw with the NEU and teachers it feels like there's a pressure to accept unsafe workplaces in order to save jobs or to accept a loss of jobs a hit to the economy as the cost of keeping work people safe um, and this is reinforced every single day on the news and by the government who talk endlessly about the economic impact of lockdown and treat job losses as an inevitability um, but obviously as revolutionaries we know that there are always choices and those choices are made by the ruling class in their interest but organizing can be begin to open up possibilities for rejecting this opposition between safe jobs and having jobs at all um, and ultimately, capitalists have always told us there's a trade-off between secure jobs and safe jobs. Um, you know, long before the pandemic, people were sacked for raising health and safety concerns, especially in industries like construction. And what protections and legal protections, that kind of thing we do have around health and safety, have obviously taken a long fight and a long history of rejecting this false opposition um, to achieve. Um, but really, the context of the pandemic just makes all of this more acute. But also, um, in many ways, the unique context of the pandemic makes it easier to organise around health and safety at work, since concerns are hard to dismiss, and in the middle of a public health emergency, workers' concerns of health and safety are necessarily also public. You know, if people get coronavirus at work, then we'll like to pass it on to people outside of work. And so there's, in many ways, actually more opportunity uh, to galvanise public support. Um, so obviously, as Marxists, we know the law isn't on our side. But that being said, things that we do have in law, like the requirement for collective consultation over large scale redundancies and statutory protections for health and safety reps, etc., can provide opportunities for organising, even in the least organised workplaces. So this is why it's still important to know what the law says. Um, and as our Australian members, we have access to the Labour Research Department's publications, and I've found these absolutely essential for me whilst I've been organising. So, um, in my former workplace, former, as I'm now redundant, um, there's no trade union recognition. Um, I worked at a very large health charity, which manages NHS contracts. And for those who don't know, charities in general are quite unorganised. Um, a lot of the work is very, there's a lot of emotive pressure to kind of do the work unselfishly, because you're meant to be there of the goodness of your heart. And the sector relies a lot on kind of patronage and networking, um, especially in the more senior management. And CEOs like to kind of, in this sector, like to sell their brand as being kind of uniquely altruistic people working for a good cause, etc. despite often earning eye-watering sums of money. And the workplace atmosphere is incredibly kind of effective. It's very neoliberal focus on well-being, but a real reluctance and often punishment for talking about workplace issues, frankly and directly. And for the almost two years I worked there, I was looking for opportunities to organise around. Um, and over time, from talking to colleagues at leaving dues and Christmas parties, as well as some lucky breaks, like meeting colleagues at uh, Palestine demos or even having Irish and young comrades in the workplace, which I hadn't known about, um, I managed to get in contact with about three to six people who are interested in helping to organise in the workplace. And to put this into context, there's about 500 workers in my office and about 2,000 nationally. Um, so, often kind of seeking out organising opportunities can seem quite fruitless and it often feels like it doesn't really yield results. 
but nonetheless, it's often just about making use of, of whatever resources you have at your, your disposal. So in my old workplace, there's a company intranet, uh, kind of internal social media platform, which I've used periodically to raise things such as um, back in February, asking if we were testing our frontline staff when COVID first hit, etc. And usually this didn't yield many results. Um, it just not much in terms of uptake, but a few kind of likes on my comments, etc. But it did provide a kind of low risk means of testing the water and working out who might be sympathetic, getting myself recognized by sympathetic employees as someone they might talk to about workplace issues and kind of saying who the primary kind of antagonists might be. And I also, you know, around this full strike for climate, I managed to get together I don't know, maybe 10 colleagues to hold up some signs in solidarity. So these kind of small things. But in late March, the charity announced that they'd be making around 200 redundancies and furloughing around 400 employees. And I was told at the same time that my role was at risk of redundancy. And when I, I phoned Ian, because uh, he offered to have a chat, and he kind of helped me transition from despondency to seeing this as a, an organizing opportunity. Um, but I could sing Ian's praises all day because he's been excellent. Um, but to be honest, I think he'd probably just get annoyed by that. Um, and I think I'd be placing undue expectations on Ian as an individual. Because the important point to draw is kind of, actually, it's just really important having someone to talk things through with, and to bounce ideas off and to offer advice. Um, and that's something we can all do for each other. And that's why it's so important that we have our trade union fractions in RS21. Um, so for instance, in Unite, we've got a group of RS21 members in Unite, where we're able to talk with, bounce ideas off each other and talk about internal union affairs. Um, but this was where kind of, despite not feeling like it at the time, I realized that my unsuccessful efforts at agitating had still had an effect. Um, one of my colleagues was really annoyed about the furlough letter that employees had been asked to sign, which threatened them with unpaid leave or redundancy if they didn't return the signed letter in 24 hours. And they got in touch with me to tell me that they joined Unite. And we had a phone call about how we could go about addressing what was wrong with how the employer was treating employees. And one of the things I noted, um, the one main issues, was not being able to communicate easily with other employees without management supervision. Um, and they came up with the idea of creating a WhatsApp group for all the furloughed employees, which you could use without having to go through company systems. Um, at the same time, I got in touch with my Unite branch to let them know about the proposed large scale redundancies. And the first response I received was a really good lesson in the attitudes of the trade union bureaucracy. Um, I was essentially told that since the workplace was unorganized, by which they meant that Unite had no recognition agreement, there was nothing they could do. They then spent kind of several paragraphs dedicated to lecturing me on the importance of organizing in the workplace, meaning getting a recognition agreement. Um, but after some back and forth, explaining that I saw these redundancies as precisely an opportunity to organize, um, I managed to get the branch to send me the contact details of a handful of members. And I'd asked for these contact details um, several, so I, countless times before, but to no avail, but I think, Presumably the prospect of large scale redundancies did the trick this time. And from this, I was able to hold a very small initial members meeting and get myself and a colleague elected as reps. And this I think is also really important, even for comrades where we don't have union recognition in the workplace, that doesn't stop you organizing um, as, a, as a union um, and being, still being recognized as reps by the union, if not by the workplace. And that gives you access to all sorts of support from the main union. Um, and at these meetings, we were also able to kind of test our arguments. Um, so we were able to have discussions about how senior management were always the best at interpreting and ex executing the charitable mission and how often they made decisions based on interests which we as workers don't share. Um, but as soon as I was told that I was at risk of redundancy as well, I worked, out, I worked hard to find out who would act as the employee representatives for collective consultation. And I found out that this was the charity's employee forum. Um, and as luck would have it, they were recruiting. So I ran for that and got on unopposed. Um, but one of the first things we did as union members were to respond to prospective redundancies, um, was to do a petition calling on the employer not to make anyone redundant whilst they could furlough them instead. And to distribute this petition, we used our WhatsApp groups and the company internet, as well as kind of personal contacts, that kind of thing. And within a week, we got 120 signatures. But crucially, we also use the petition as a way of allowing people to leave their personal email addresses to remain in contact, reducing our reliance on the company systems. And using this email list, which we grew pretty much every week, 
I sent out a weekly email with updates on the redundancy consultations and issues we identified, as well as ways that the employer should have been doing things differently. And our union members also got together and produced two documents, a guide to collective consultation um, based on AACAS guidelines and what employees should expect from it, and an FAQ on why you should join a union. And I attached both of these to every email each week. And I think the main thing that this email achieved was to give people, even outside the union, the confidence to raise things as they went through consultation themselves and pushed a lot of issues out of the shadows. And people were really appreciative of these emails. Um, but also, since I was on the employee forum, I was also partial to all the information that was being shared with employee representatives, even if the employee forum itself was quite a toothless body. Um, and obviously, how the, therefore, how the consultation was being handled. And since I had access to the Labour Research Department booklets, I had an on-hand resource for identifying what was being done wrong. And often I was better informed in this than HR themselves. Um, so we carried on this way for most of the consultation, responding to developments with petitions, etc., and held pretty much weekly union meetings. And by the end of the consultation, we had grown about 10 times as a union group. And if I had to guess, I'd say we're only a few months off recognition now. But what's also remarkable is just how much of a reaction we got from the employer. Despite the fact that we certainly weren't organising with anything like as much of the leverage as an established union in the workplace, the employer responded in an incredibly draconian way. You have five minutes left, Will. Thanks. And after I was accidentally copied into an email which said, Will poses a significant risk to the organisation, challenging his own consultation and mobilising others, I submitted a subject access request and discovered entire email chains between managers and HR talking about how they didn't want to run the risk of giving the union credence and discussing in detail how they're going to respond to each of our posts that we did as a union. And I think it goes to show how unused to organisation um, employers often are, but also how much more of a sense they have the power that their workers have than we sometimes do. But moving on to kind of the issue of health and safety. Incidentally, whilst I was on the Employee Forum, I soon realised the Employee Forum was something what's called Representatives of Employee Safety. And representatives of Employee Safety are essentially trade union health and safety reps, but in workplaces where you don't have a recognised union. And whilst they have far fewer rights and protections, they still have some. For instance, employers have to tell all employees who their representatives of employee safety are, um, and they have to make sure they're adequately trained in health and safety law. And since I worked out my employer definitely hadn't done either of these things, I started raising this with my fellow Employee Forum reps. And the attitude I took to the employee forum was that I was there to communicate with employees through the consultation and to get information. And whilst there were likely to be some conscientious employees on the employee forum, it was also likely to include quite a few tabs. So my strategy there was to try and explain things as clearly and as firmly as possible to all of the employee forum. And incidentally, the chair and management hated this because they wanted things to go as privately as possible. So after I started raising health and safety, it didn't take long before I was allowed to attend senior leadership meetings on back to work planning basically to get me to shut up about it. And after I reported back from this meeting to employee reps and repeated my concerns about the employer not fulfilling legal, legal requirements to consult employees over health and safety, I was suspended from the employee or and my role as representative employee safety pending disciplinary investigation. Um, but again, when, I, when this happened, I asked for advice from the, Unite, from the um, RS1 Unite fraction and Jill George very helpfully suggested that my FTO, my full-time officer, could intervene on my behalf from the union. And he did, sending, you know, asking for this kangaroo court to uh, cease action against me. But I mean, whilst this isn't a kind of feel-good story, you know, I still lost my job and we didn't manage to prevent any redundancies, it is a lesson in how even in the most inopportune circumstances, you can still start to organise. And I've watched a lot of my work colleagues go from being pretty credulous and apolitical, being much more savvy, but also much more hopeful about the potential for organising. And we started talking about formalising a reps committee, linking up with reps and other charities, um, for instance, Comic Relief and RSPCA, and something at Bureaux, and that's something that, yeah, the trade union bureaucracy can support with that. Um, so we still need to engage with the union in that sense. And the more we connect with workers going through similar experiences, the better and the more of a movement we build. Um, but also we kind of talked about opposing the fatalism of job cuts by strategizing about how we can campaign to save services. And, you know, the despondency of job losses has been tempered with the growth in our membership, and colleagues are starting to think about long-term strategy. So we talked about how we can campaign against preventing the workplace, for instance, and things which seemed impossible only a few months ago actually now seem like real possibilities. So I think the take-home points, basically, are even in unorganized workplaces, there's so much you can do. And even if you can't see an immediate opportunity, the little things you can do are still worth doing. 
since we're entering a period of crisis, even small monthly union meeting is building capacity and laying the ground for kind of future battles. But also, you know, rely on your comrades in Irish 21. Um, just having that experience, having that um, camarade, that comradeship is so important to support you through these things. And there's so many transferable lessons. Um, and I think kind of, you know, on that slightly more hopeful note, that probably leads quite well into thinking more about that long-term strategy and what Willie can probably talk about a little more. Thank you. I'm now going to introduce our second speaker of the afternoon, who's Willie Black. Willie is an anti-poverty and environmental campaigner who's based in Edinburgh. Yeah, we're just back from the, the nurses demonstration and it gives you uh, an indication of what's happening uh, and the anger. And um, if I had another 10 minutes, I might be able to tell you some of the stuff that was going on there. But it's absolutely clear, maybe just for that example, I don't know if, um, if it's true everywhere, but Unison, Unite and the GMB were absent from the demonstration. I don't know if that's, that's happening, whether they think, and it's an indication, if it's, if it's a, just an empirical view and it's no reality, then you, the, the unions are fighting back, they're calling demonstrations and all that, then maybe in the example of Edinburgh is no, is no uh, the, the regular one. Uh, maybe they're, across the country, people are doing things uh, under the union banners and the other union banners. But it's also an indication, if it's true, that what's happening in Edinburgh, and it's probably true, that they don't like um, not being in control. Uh, and these rank and file, uh, nurses for pay and, and other forums, which are mobilizing in the anger, um, as an example of maybe what we're, we're going to experience, that relying on the trade union leaders, uh, and I'll come on to the trade union leaders in the concessionary bargain and area and in other words, in other ways, um, I think that's, um, that's going to be really important to understand the, the role of the full-time officials, the trade unions, its limits, but it's also potentially, uh, and I'll come on to the, to the, the, the education union that called the, the mass uh, meeting on Zoom and got 22,000 uh, people uh, to, to come in. This is a new experience, something, the biggest mass meeting uh, in history, probably, but on Zoom, on, on um, uh, talking about organising uh, in the schools against the, the, the return to, the, to an unsafe uh, environment and a potential um, um, health risk. But I think that if we, if we fight, the truism is that you get something, and Will is a great example, you know, you just get one will and another will comes along. Um, and to be honest, that his example is probably the norm uh, in many places that people will experience. And that's true not only in workplaces, but also in communities and all that. And I'll, I'll come on to the question of the, the whole concessionary bargaining situation. What we're seeing now is that this is becoming become the dominant feature inside uh, I mean, the resistance against redundancy is pretty low. Um, it's pretty abysmal. It's maybe people, the unions or the workers think, oh, we'll, we'll bounce back. But um, there's a Marxist uh, economist that I've been looking at and, and following, Michael Roberts, that talks about a longer depression, uh, the, the, the falling rate of profit, the economics of the situation. What's underlying, what's the, um, the situation in, in capitalism is that we've been in a depression, an economic uh, downturn for a long time, from before 2008, but certainly uh, since that. And if you look at the fallen rate of profit, if you look at the zombie com companies that are out there, just um, surviving on uh, borrowing, um, making, making themselves look okay to the shareholders and etc. If that net goes away, if the borrowing come, uh, regime uh, collapses, the bond market squeezes them uh, hard, what we're going to see and what we are seeing is millions of people being unemployed and that will throw up challenges for us, um, uh, mainly in the private sector, 
but also in the, the public sector as well. So you see, the thing that, that we're dealing with, and, and, and Will's a great example of it, is if you do something, there's a struggle. And uh, Tony Cliff used to describe it as this, is that in each workplace, there is the fighters, the class conscious. Maybe it's just trade union consciousness, but in some cases, it's other people that are much clearer about what kind of society we live under and want to fight back. And then on the other hand, there is the people who have got very little class consciousness, who accept the dominant ideas in society. And one of the dominant ideas is you have to make a profit. And that is a colossal problem when there is a collapse of profit within workplaces that people, uh, that the loss, and that's what the, the COVID-19 has actually created, that the profit has went for, for thousands and thousands of no millions of firms and workplaces acro across the world. And this is then comes into being this question about whether you fight back and you have to have a set of ideas that challenges the ideas that if we're not making a profit, we should still exist. And that then brings the state, the demands on the state. And those who say, we're not having anything to do with the state and whatever are wrong here, because the state forced to come into our lives in terms of our workplaces, that means there's a set of demands. And that means then we didn't need to accept the whole idea of give back or concessionary bargain. One of the things that um, we should be saying and clearer in our minds these are, these are terms and conditions that are not our right to give up. We probably ended up in a workplace with a pension, with a pay scale, with conditions that were fought for, for people, by people in the past, other workers, and we went into that workplace. Hopefully, we increased the terms and conditions, but they're not ours to give. We must leave that workplace like Will has with his best chance that we defend in terms and conditions. And therefore we cannot um, uh, allow that situation to, uh, to, to happen. And the, the great miner strike, one of the, the, the cries was, it wasn't a right for a miner somewhere else to, to vote, to put another miner down the road. And, and this was a crucial point of why we weren't for balloting uh, the miners in the, in the miner strike. For a pre prevailing time, that was the that was the dominant idea that you have to grow solidarity, show solidarity, not vote for it and put somebody else out a job. And these are arguments that we can we can raise. Um, obviously, you've got to be sensitive about it, and whatever. So that whole question of um, was something that I often use is that in every workplace, if it looks like spontaneity spontaneity with a red vest. There is somebody there that's saying no. There is, in every workplace and in communities, there will be within this, people will accept anything and people that wouldn't accept a thousand pounds a week if that was offered. That in between, there is a lot of people that are listening, winnable and argue, you know, even if it looks poor for our ideas to come in to that set of um, workers or communities, it's necessary for it to recognize that in every place, and I, and I would say nearly every place, uh, there is people who will be responsive uh, to the ideas of fight back uh, and the rest. And the problem is the trade union leaders are, are an important, com um, an important element in what happens so, for instance, that example that I showed or I spoke about when the trade union leaders in the education union, uh, the NEU, uh, called a meeting online and got 20, 22,000 people to, to come in um, into their, to their meeting to talk about resistance and whatever. These are great examples, but they're often few and far between, and they will be few and far between. So I think the problem that is that we have historically we have an understanding in our tradition, we have an understanding of the trade union leaders. 
I mean, the great, the best example uh, probably was during the 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 general strike. Uh, there's uh, numerous um, accounts of the general council being brought into ten Downing Street. And the Prime Minister at the time said, right, gentlemen, you're more powerful than the state. What are you going to do now? And they then said, we're beaten. Because they weren't interested in actually running the state. That wasn't what they were there for. They were there to defend terms and conditions. And that then matters in terms of how society, I mean, there's the example, and I know it's a, it's a joke, but there's an example of, of that. What I, for me, it's always been a, a clarity and a, a clear a joke. The mass meeting, a full-time official come out and say, right, we've got your fiver. And the mass meeting says, rejects it. So they trundle back to the management. They come back and they say, right, we've got your tenner. Again, the mass meeting rejects it. And then the, they go away and they come back. We've got your 15 pound. And they reject it again. And in the frustration, the full-time official shouts, what the hell do you want? And a wee voice at the back said, socialism. And of course he says, or she said, the management will never agree to that. And that whole idea of the limitations, and when the trade Got union- Got five minutes so, left, Willie. All right. When the, when the trade union leaders are, are brought in for the cold, into the cosy settlements, uh, you know, Michael Gove, such an inspirational person, of course, but nevertheless, it ends up that they feel the back in. So they want to stage army people, but not for the purposes of taking over the state. Or, or so it's a, it, they accept that dominant idea, that idea that, that's in um, lots of people's ideas, that the only way that they can improve terms and conditions is if they recover, get capitalism to recover. And that's, and that's the left as well as the right. That's why the awkward squad is no longer awkward. That, that, the, that's, the, that's one of the problems. So I think that what we've got to make sure is that in a period which is full of possibilities, we've seen some of the, some of the struggles that have gone on, Black Lives Matter, uh, the struggle on the environment and the, and the rest, and the possibility that we can have a, a fight back um, situation. So the coronavirus has made the state more powerful, but it's also shown people that the state could actually change people's lives. So their whole argument about uh, you know the the the, the crisis or, or um, means that billions are being poured in that that we wouldn't have thought about or could have expected the state to do or put in um, the, the billions and the trillions that they've done. Trump has actually put, is now talking about a 2.5 trillion uh, pound investment. Now, of course, many of that goes to the bosses direct, but nevertheless, the furlough situation. Now, what we have to recognize is that socialists, is that we're going to have to deal with this situation and it's not going to be uh, a sudden, uh, recovery um, in, in the situation. So we will need to think about how do we mobilize and organize people to fight for jobs and what kind of jobs. And it means then that our arguments about the state investing in, green, in, in climate jobs becomes possible because people will be looking for, for that kind of, kind of answer. So the job slaughter that's going to occur when the furlough um, um, goes in October and all these zombie companies collapse and uh, particularly on our high streets, the service industry, hospitality industry and whatever, we need to see how it's possible uh, to, to, take, um, to take action to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to move that. The other thing of course is that if we hadn't had Black Lives Matter, Farage and the racists we'd have had a, a much clearer road. Um, you know, the, the whole question of them now increasing um, the, the, the racist attacks on um, people in a, a dinghy, in a rubber boat, 
uh, pregnant and, and with their children coming across the channel as if this is a great challenge to the British way of life. To be honest, we need to be stepping up there. So that means then, um, as comrades, as an organisation, we need to be on, on the front line there uh, and making sure that, uh, but Black Lives Matter has made it um, more uh, harder. But Black Lives Matter must continue, must be expanded, must be on everybody's uh, uh, radar uh, and, and help and support for that. Um, I think the whole question of the economic situation, the climate issue uh, and the virus crosses over and it means then that we will have opportunities as, as fighters, as class conscious workers, as revolutionaries to put our arguments over. Yes, in some ways, difficult terrain, but nevertheless, the terrain is opening up. There is no question about it. I mean, I, I don't know about yous, but I've been on mayor's zooms and I can, uh, and I've had dinners. So the question then is, we're talking to people and we need to find a way in which that, that clarity or our thoughts, maybe I've not been clear enough, but nevertheless, that clarity um, or how to fight, when to fight, and, and what can be won means that we'll, we'll be in the position to challenge um, capitalism in our wee neck of the woods. But we need to also look to the international situation and encourage resistance and fight back, like in Portland and Seattle and places like that, that have been an inspiration to, to, to many of us on these dark uh, days. But it's no 11th hour uh, to midnight. This is much better terrain uh, than, than we have had for a, for a number of times because capitalism naked is out there uh, to be exposed. Thank you very much Willie and thank you to both of our speakers. We're now going to open up the uh, meeting for an open discussion. So I, I think I, I quite liked Willie's peroration there talking about how it's not the last hour before midnight, and we're in, a, we're in a better position than that. Um, I'm generally fairly pessimistic, at least about politics in this country, but I do think there is a, a real possibility of things changing very quickly in the UK. Um, I must say, I think partly what's going on in the US is filtering through, and particularly around Black Lives Matter, we saw huge demonstrations across this country as well. Nonetheless, that if you look at the, the, the NHS demonstrations and the fact that there's been an ongoing strike in Tower, in Tower Hamlets and so on, um, th there's the possibilities of just tempted to being able to say that, you know, there could be the start of a, a wave of struggle, just maybe, let's wait and see. Um, and as things kick in and the fellow comes to an end and the, all the other so-called so goodies we're getting from this government come to an end, then that might, or the chance of that increasing, uh, the chance of that will, will increase. Um, but I want to talk a bit about the Labour left, actually, which I suspect is going to make people groan internally. But I think it's actually important. I, I've noticed a couple of things recently. And I don't think it's just me, but they seem significant. Like Jeremy Corbyn coming out and explicitly attacking the people on the right and saying that he, they were sabotaging the election campaign in 2017, which I don't think the, Diane Abbott, I think, again, explicitly attacking the people, um, the people, um, you know, who were sort of named in this report as being the one who sabotaged the 2017 election campaign. McCluskey suggesting that Labour shouldn't take the funds from Unite for granted. And I've heard it was about a big conference being called for October. I don't know if any, if any by Unite, I don't know if anyone knows anything about what, that, what that's meant to do or achieve. But it just feels like there's a hardening up going there as we approach... The One minute left, the, Roderick. Yeah, as we approach the date for when the report from the uh, EHRC is, is, is about to be released. And what it all means, I don't know, but it just starts to feel as if the Labour left is starting to sort of dis, be increasingly dis... I'm not sure what I'm not break away, but increasingly become... Incre dis dis okay, I don't know the word, anyway. Moving away from... Labour leadership in a way that I haven't seen up till now, and I mean, I I would like to find out what other people know about this and what they think. Um, hi, Aussie Cambridge. Um, yeah, I, just following on from the most of what Willie said, actually. I mean, I think the scale of the redundancies is going to be a genuinely earth-shattering event. I mean, 
if you look at the way the, um, the, the BA situation has evolved, I mean, I'm not going to support BA and I do want the aviation sector to rapidly slow down so we can actually breathe clean air. But at the same time, we don't want 40,000 jobs um, going at the same time. Diversification, obviously. Um, but the things, the BA system, they've abused the furlough scheme, they've paid their dividends to their shareholders, and now they're literally slashing in half the terms and conditions of the cabin crew, and they wouldn't even offer them the deal they gave to the pilots. The classic case of divine rule, which shouldn't have been allowed, that for a shit, you'd never let it to be otherwise. Um, but that's going to be disastrous. The manufacturing sector is taking a hammering at the moment. It's like people are not coming back from Thailand. We are losing plants all over the shop. I know because I'm the chair of the manufacturing sector for London Eastern Region. Um, yeah, and also the high street is like the people are returning to the shops. And in Mill Road in Cambridge, where I live, we we currently have our high street. We've closed Mill Road to cars, so people can actually social distance. The trainers are up in arms. We're trying to explain to them the problem you're facing is Amazon, not the lack of cars on Mill Road because nobody drives to the shops anymore. We walk to the shops, so we walk safely. But Amazon is taking over the entire high street, and the government's letting them get away with it. It's like so, and the, the real thing that we have to be very alert to is that the fact that the the private sector rental um, ban, so the private sector eviction ban is being lifted at the end of this month, okay? And there is a genuine concern that the jobless crisis is going to turn into a homeless crisis. Now, if people start losing their homes over their heads, there will be something akin to a riot. And I'm not actually opposed. To I think we do need a new Jarrow march, something like that. Maybe it doesn't have to come from Jarrow or West London, but people have to march on the capital to say we are literally jobless, homeless, and very, very annoyed. <laughs> and there's a massive argument. That I think we have to make a socialist for that to actually happen. Yes. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> a couple of points. I mean, one is really carrying on from what um, Ozzy was saying there. That's a little from um, Sussex, um, RS21. Um, uh, basically, yeah, I mean, you're going to see mass redundancies. Um, Certainly, over the next few months, and this kind of thing, and one of um, one, it, it kind of links in a little bit with uh, something else I'm going to talk about. We'll start with this. Um, to do with what Willie Black was saying about full time officials. Now, like, like Willie, I'm an ex, I'm an ex member of the EETPU, and uh, you have to you have to be able to deal with um, officials who are unelected, unaccountable, and this kind of stuff. And I think this it's, it is it is. A, I just want to kind of do a little bit of a caveat for what Willie was saying because I think we do have to deal with these people um, and certainly as far as rank and file members are concerned my experience in the past is that they expect you to be dealing with you know with the, the full-time officials and they also expect the full-time officials to be on side with whatever it is that you want to do so we have to have a, a relationship in, in some sense with them even though we're quite hostile to them in terms of them just wanting to you know just, just to sit down with management all the time so that's, that's the first point um, I certainly think what Will, Will Searle said earlier on about how to organize you know you have to discuss it with everybody make sure everybody knows everything that is going on and you're feeling about it's an absolutely excellent example of how to do that uh, but linking to do with with the redundancy and stuff of course um in sussex is crawley which is uh, the worst hit um constituency in the uk in terms of the economic results of covid largely because of its reliance on gatwick airport as a as, as an employer um and certainly so, yeah again linking with what, with what um, ozzy was saying about um what's happening in british airways a lot of people in Crawley are going to be economically really hit with this. And one of the things that, that and we had a meeting last week and one of the comrades in Crawley said the British, that Britain first are out on the streets in Crawley, not all the time, but they're out leafleting um, every couple of weeks, which we're the situation we're, we're trying to monitor and get in contact with any anti-racist organization. <coughs> so I don't know if, if anybody else has seen this, but obviously it's not just the left that can benefit from this as the far right can also try and, make gains in this despite black lives matters One despite minute, the then. anti-racism despite the anti-racist sort of like a mood that we've that we've seen develop um, in large parts of the country is that the the, the 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 fascists are quite capable of trying to exploit that situation so that is something i think we need to look at and as i say we're, we're looking at the situation in crawley and trying to trying to see who we can ally with and what we can actually do about the fascists thanks Hazel. Uh -huh. Um, okay, thanks. So if, thanks to will for basically running through what you have gone through um the most difficult thing i find is actually starting from the very beginning and being on your own and you know it's it's a massive achievement that you got to absolutely and you need to be so proud of what you've managed to do there um i uh, just want to talk a little bit about 
my experience with um, the charity sector, which was pretty much the same as Will's, um, I got made redundant from a charity called Jewish Care um, back in 2009 when the um, economic crisis hit. And it was just horrible looking at all the elitists, basically. Um, you know, Golden, Goldman Sachs were absolutely fundamental in that economic crash and a lot of our major donors were at Goldman Sachs and they were walking around our building like they owned the place at the time when the announcements around the redundancies were happening. Sir Philip Green as well was one of our major donors had pledged four million pound the year before and then as soon as um, the banks crashed he pulled out um, and, you know, I just want to say to everybody how difficult it is in the charity not-for-profit sector and how difficult it is going to be going forward because it is a very ununionized um, sector, the same as ho the hospitality sector, in fact. Um, and, you know, it's difficult to fight when you're only a few people. Um, in terms of my situation, um, yeah it is so difficult One minute, please we're fighting against the government we're not fighting against an employer um and therefore we can raise our voices in the workplace however it makes absolutely no difference because it's not the employer that's making the decision it's government that's making the decision yeah thanks hazel just two quick questions really one do you do we think that we should be fighting in a different way or focusing our energy more on jobs which are in the interests directly vital for the well-being of society, like Will the Younger's job, sorry to go by experiences, by, by appearances, uh, and uh, uh, compared with aviation jobs? And secondly, hearing the two Wills sort of together like that, um, should, should, should we be thinking how um, neighbourhood organising, because as most of you know, Willie, although with a tremendous um, insights from previous experience in workplaces, is now up to his neck in neighbourhood organisation in, in, in Edinburgh. Are the ways that neighbourhood organisation could help workplace organisation? What, 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 what are the ways that that might be possible? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about the, our experience in fighting um, university reopening under COVID-19 because um, I think it illustrates some of the opportunities and, and problems that we're, that, that we're having. Um, it, what we're doing came about from um, a meeting just in my department. I called a, UCU, a, member, a meeting of all UCU members because I knew there were people um, who were extremely uneasy about the plans to reopen. Um, from that we expanded it into contacts that we had into other departments and effectively um, to cut a very long story short we had about eight or nine people completely unofficially outside the union structures producing an open letter with a lot of very well reasoned uh, supporting materials um, and in the course of it it became very very political so the arguments that we were making were about this is nothing to do with, with, with people's education. It's nothing to do with welfare. It's all about being able to, to, to rent out the accommodation to students. It's, it, it's driven by neoliberal economics. Um, it brought in all the other aspects. So um, the inequalities over who suffers um, disproportionately, the poor, ethnic minorities and, and so on. All that stuff is in there. And so it actually is a very, very political open letter at the end of the day. Um, when we produced it and sent it to um, the, the UCU committee, it's worth, me, it's worth reading out the response that we got, which was um, the university management will resist any attempt to make changes to their instructions and they will adduce the following arguments. So this is the branch president making arguments on behalf of the university about why this is a waste of time. Um, they have experts to expert advice, whether, whereas the authors and signatures of the open letter are not epidemiologists. They have discussed their plans with the Scottish Government. The First Minister has publicly encouraged students from outside Scotland to come and return here to study, and UCU Scotland isn't opposing, opposing such a move. So that's what we faced from our own union leadership. 
Um, One into, minute, Mike. In terms of trying to get a response. So anyway, so I need to cut it short, but it really illustrates the, the issues, I think. And when we and, and that was the same response from UCU Scotland full-time officer. What we managed to do was actually, rather than just go away and with our tail between our legs, we expanded the number of people involved in producing this. And through that process, we're now in a position where this is actually being presented to management at the next joint negotiating committee. And we're putting it up publicly and making um, it effectively an arm's length campaign from the from the UCU branch because we can't really basically trust the leadership of the branch to, uh, to to push this forward. So I just think it's quite illustrative that these issues are they encompass all the crises, they encompass all all the politics, but actually you can get things moving as well and i'm confident that whatever the outcome is and we we're fighting on all sorts of fronts uh, freedom of information requests um going to getting people to raise questions at the university court making a nuisance at all these levels going to the press and so on uh, and the, you know what we get out of it at the end of the day won't just be a struggle over covid and the conditions of return to work it'll actually put us in a much better position in, in terms of the other things that are coming up because i've no doubt that job cuts will also be, be, be down the line as well with this um so it's really just a report on what we've done, the difficulties we had, but the real opportunities that I think that are there as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, Will's story illustrated the importance of doing the small stuff, which I think when everything's so grim and there's such a tidal wave of job losses and attacks, it's easy to get that kind of feeling of pointlessness and that the, you know there's nothing you can do. Um, and I think most people, most of the time, are in situations where they don't believe that they can get the really big win that's needed, you know, like force the government to uh, offer a million climate jobs or something may not be something they can do before they lose their job in 30 days. So I think like pushing that small stuff is really, really important in terms of building uh, power. But at the same time, the overall response to the job losses, which have already started, I mean, there's millions of people um, uh, already either out of work or not, you know, technically still in work, but on zero hours contracts, not getting any hours. Um, the response has been absolutely pitiful so far from from the unions. I mean, you know, where's where's the action? I mean, the Tate in London of voted to strike, which I think is fantastic. We should be highlighting that. But I think we do need to think about the different power relationship that mass unemployment creates. So if your employer is in financial difficulties, you can get that feeling that Nicola described of there's no point just fighting my employer because they're, they're, they seem almost helpless in the way, you know, in the face of this much bigger crisis. So I, I think the issue of occupations is one we need to keep raising. So whenever we've seen struggles over jobs during mass, you know, huge downturns, workplace occupations have been vital um, to... Uh, partly because they allow you to seize capital, so they stop your employer <coughs> selling stuff off, um, but also because they can create a base from which you can politically argue for nationalisation and conversion to useful, uh, useful production. And, and I think, you know, given the strength of the climate movement, those One minute left. we need to be making, it, whether it's at a propaganda level in most cases, but, you know, looking for opportunities to put them in a very uh, concrete way as well. I'm going to take one more speaker now and then we're going to move on to our third uh, main main speaker in the meeting, Kate. If people could re-indicate after Kate's finished speaking, we're then going to have another period of open discussion and you can, of course, refer to what has been said in this first session. Yes. Um, so very, very quickly, and just to make a couple of practical points. Um, uh, one is this, um, someone raised the issue about unions um, attitude to the nurses demos further up. Um, I can't say for the GMB and Unite, Unison are actively discouraging people from having any anything to do with the nurse, with the nurses movement. So Unison companies need to be aware of that. But I just wanted to say something, something else that came up in the, in the discussion briefly was talk about, because a lot of people have talked about the charity not profit sector and it might to think about whether it might actually be worthwhile uh, pulling together a charity not for profit fraction because I found I mean I found a lot of what Will Serby was saying very useful in terms of thinking about my own experience uh, working in charity even though I'm in a different union in some ways the experience across 
you know, the, the experience in the sector, just as for health workers, is actually more important than which union you're in. So I, I think that would be one of the useful practical things that could come out of this session. I'm going to um, move on now to introduce Kate Bradley. Um, Kate is a member of Manchester Office 21 and the outgoing chair of Manchester Acorn, the community union. Hello, I don't think I'll speak for 20 minutes. I'll try not okay. to. I think that was the, the length of time I was allotted, but um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I, the, the reason I kind of popped up in the chat once there to say we're going to talk a bit more about homelessness and, and, and things um, here is because I'm mostly going to focus on um, housing activism evictions and the coming crisis um, here. So it'd be great to hear people's thoughts on that. Um, but um, basically, I wanted to start by saying that I think we should think back to the last crisis. Uh, I think a lot of us are thinking about all the job losses that are happening now and, and due to happen. But um, unemployment and homelessness go hand in hand, as Ozzy said. Um, following a wave of people losing their incomes, people often then lose their homes or lose the home that they're in. So they might end up in worse accommodation or cheaper accommodation elsewhere um, or not end up in accommodation at all and end up homeless. Um, we have, of course, seen a massive spike in homelessness, a historic spike since the last um, recession in 2008. Uh, you can see all the stats and graphs are out there for um, how repossessions of people's houses who had mortgages and evictions massively spiked following that um, crisis over a period of a year and a half, two years, as the um, system sorted out their punishments. Um, and I think um, because of that, we have to be very aware that we are facing this is another part of the crisis that we are about to face. Um, as socialists, historically, um, we've often wanted to focus on workplace struggles as the point of production, um, but more so than ever, the housing sector is the point of profit making for a very large number of capitalists. Um, and more than ever, the housing sector is um, one of the most expensive parts of most people's lives and therefore the thing that gets affected most when, um, if they lose their jobs or part of their income. So um, we have to also recognise that income is tied to benefits for those who don't have jobs or are losing their jobs and that universal credit is a historically bad benefit system in terms of how little it gives um, people and how, how many sanctions punishments there are involved in that system. So we are going to see, unfortunately, um, in, an, in this crisis, a real um, spike in, in homelessness and um, poverty. So um, I just wanted to uh, quickly mention social reproduction theory. So as Marx is trying to theorise the, the total system, um, we, uh, we know that when capitalists have crises, they try and force their crises on us. They try and privatise their crises so that they don't lose as much. They have the power to do this in many cases. Um, so effectively, they give, us, they give us their crisis by forcing us to go and reproduce ourselves for free um, or at a lower rate, at a lower level, using less money and less resources than we would have had before. Um, given that this follows a decade of austerity where we're already doing a lot of our own care and reproduction more so than we were um, before, it is a new, a new stage of that that we have to be aware will potentially be even worse. Um, so less pessimistically, I, think, I want to think mostly about resistance to that um, and how we can sort of um, fight back. So particularly looking at housing activism, I think one of the really great things over the last two or three years has been the massive expansion in tenants unions and community unions and their activity. So um, ACORN the union only set up in the UK about four years ago, uh, five years ago now probably. Um, but since then it has gained 4,000 members. So um, it's, and it's growing extremely rapidly as it gains traction. The last six months have been one of the most rapid growth periods for in the history of ACORN. And um, uh, ACORN as a union, it's across the UK, but there's also other tenants unions, uh, London Renters Union, Living Rent in Scotland, um, Tenants Union UK, um, and they're all growing and attempting to do the same sort of things. And I think um, it's really heartening that those are the places where struggle is happening around housing right now in a lot, um, a lot of the tenant sector because it's, um, it's actually fighting back on our own terms. So unlike an anti-austerity movement that just asks for more from the government, um, this is actually just trying to make it happen ourselves, which I think is builds working class confidence much more during a time of Tory rule <laughs> than just asking for things you're not going to get um, would. So um, 
in terms of what we're doing, I think, and this is true of all the all those unions I mentioned, but in terms of what ACON's doing, so they're preparing for the wave of potential evictions by training up very large numbers of people in each branch in resist, um, eviction resistance, um, which involves peacefully um, but stubbornly resisting evictions of your members. So if someone says they're going to be evicted, you turn out in person and um, resist in numbers. Um, it also involves, before you get to that point, fighting landlords who are trying to evict people. So I was involved in a case last year, which was a really nice win, but they were served a legal eviction notice. So I just want to make the distinction between um, different types of eviction notice. Um, the legal eviction notice was a section 21, which is the no fault eviction. They don't even have to tell you why you're being kicked out, but they give you two months. And she was served a um, section 21 and she had to just get out, but ACOR managed to um, put some pressure on the estate agent and the landlord to stop them from doing that. And she stayed in her home. Um, so there are lots of instances like that, which I think before it even gets to eviction stage where casework and pressure can, can win. Um, and because it's a very scalable model, uh, I think it's, um, it's a really positive one to be involved in because effectively all the ACOM branches share are their tactics. Broadly, they share some politics because, of course, we're trying to resist evictions, but more than that, they share tactics. So that means that any group can be trained up in the tactics of eviction resistance and get on it straight away. Um, so in that sense, I think it's really great to see the growth of, of um, tenants unions in this model, which is much more hands on, practical and direct action based. Um, what I would say, however, is that once the, it has scaled, it will face government resistance and capitalist resistance more than it has so far. So landlords do have landlord associations, they have, you know, a whole apparatuses around them to stop you from doing this sort of thing, but they haven't had to be in action for many years. So the bigger we get, the more they will start to organise against us. And I think that's something which we have to bear in mind and work out how to resist. Um, I would also raise one more question about tenants unions. I think we've heard Will and Willie and others mention the union bureaucracies in work in this, in the, um, Unite and other large unions. I think we have to be careful about um, scalability and tenants activism, turning them into like NGOs with bureaucracies, um, because it's that, that because their shared basis is tactics and not politics, and there isn't much political discussion. And because of that, it feels like we do need to um, work at how to build the rank and file in those organisations, so that you're building class power and class consciousness, as well as um, tactical wins uh, because otherwise people could come in and out of that area and not really be in a much more um, organization organizer kind of place they might just be mobilized for a particular action and then leave and not have that kind of desire to or, or ability to do more because of their learning collective learning which I think is what um, I'd like to see more of there so I talked about ACORN but I think there are loads of different organizations that can play a role in in this and it's not just about evictions it's also about repossessions it's also about um sort of uh, homelessness services um and support for people who have lost their house already um and some resistance to debt as well which i'll come to in a second but for that i think there are organizations out there you know unite the community has a unite has a community arm that i think could be doing a lot more if it felt that it was within its remit so it wasn't just a kind of sub arm of um unite the union the work workplace based union. Um, there are other community organisations, other tenants unions, and I think it's about injecting a bit of that radicalism and agitation into those spaces so that they don't just become NGOs or support um, networks because those are perfectly compatible with capitalism. <laughs> um, they just get things outsourced to them and they're quietly in the corner try and resolve the problems created by governmental and capitalist decisions and I don't think that's the long-term vision for, for um, our politics or achieving any kind of um, socialism but um i do think that just finally um the the risk of um not doing this is that we see another incredibly deep crisis that is shouldered by us as workers as um, as the working class and that in order to police that and control that we just see a very large wave of policing um a, a large wave of state repression so social services coming in to just tidy around the edges of the problems they've created um, and leaving people essentially struggling for themselves and that by getting involved in 
different forms. It, the workplace activism is, is crucial in preventing it getting to that stage. And then there's all these other forms of, of activism in the community, which I think can help deal with those um, problems or, or resist the disempowerment um, of, of workers to, uh, that follows uh, large scale unemployment. Um, yeah, just as a final point, um, if anyone wants to know more about what different types of eviction they are, uh, there are, then I'm happy to talk about that. But just briefly, the one I'm most scared of at the moment, um, which will affect people in the private and public housing sector, um, anyone who's renting, is uh, Section 8 evictions. So if you're in rent arrears for more than two months, your landlord can serve you an eviction uh, notice without really a blink of like, you know, of the eyelids of the council or anything. They, they can just kick you straight out. And obviously coronavirus has been going on for about five months now and some people lost their job at the start. So we are going to see as soon as that eviction ban is lifted, large scale attempts at eviction. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see landlords and estate agents try to um, stagger it out over a course of months to keep their own costs down. Um, and during that, I think, um, time, there has been talk from even from Labour about Section 8 requiring revisions, like making it a longer period. But what ACORN and others have been trying to do is um, get local councils to um, enforce stricter, um, to hire more staff, basically, and enforce stricter lines on those Section 8s, make sure they're all legal, make sure they all resist, uh, try and get landlords to make other options first before they issue a Section 8. So there are kind of like reformist ways to approach that as well. But um, in the longer term, I think that's what we're looking at. If someone gets served a Section 8 eviction, that's, that's going to be the mass type that comes about. And that's what we need to um, yeah, be talking about um, resisting mostly, I think, here um, for those particular tenants. Um, anyway, I think I'll, I'll come to a close there. But... Um, Final point, there are lots of other things I didn't really cover in this because it was a really huge brief I was given. It was like, talk about everything else. Um, so um, if anyone wants to contribute anything to this discussion that wasn't raised in either one, then that's really legit. <laughs> um, and the final thing I wanted to say was just about debt. I think we haven't talked about it in this meeting much, but it's the field I'm kind of working in at the moment as a caseworker, supporting people in serious debt. Um, and we are going to see a massive spike in consumer debt um, as people try and take out take out debts to pay for their rent and living costs that they've lost. Um, there are lots of ways to resist debt, but from what I can see, no one's doing it in the UK, really. Um, there are some law firms doing it and then there's some charities directing you. Charities often paid for by money lenders, by the way, <laughs> directing you to certain easy methods of um, signing up to a plan, but it doesn't actually help you really. It just reduces your monthly payments for a little while. Um, so if anybody is either in debt or interested in debt um, as a concept and wants to do something together, uh, I've tried reaching out to some groups that look like they're doing something and no answers. So maybe they're not there anymore. So it would be really great if any comrades are interested in it to yeah, get in touch with me because I'm really keen on working out what we can do in forms of debt resistance. I think it could be really creative. I can see an acorny sort of model for doing it, but I'd like to put it past some people. Um, yeah, so please do get in touch if you are, um, or, or raise it now. I'd like to hear a discussion. What I'm going to do is we're going to carry on with the discussion until about 10 to 3, and then I'm going to briefly bring all the speakers back at the end just to do a little, little short summation. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Pete, for a most inspiring and helpful contribution. Um, I just wanted to mention something that I'm old enough to be to have been involved in the anti poll tax campaign back in the Thatcher's Britain in the late 80s, early 90s. Now, I think there was quite a lot of scepticism about the, how well that would work because it was very much a community based campaign. There was attempts to get trade unions behind it, but that was limited. But anyway, the good thing was that not only did the anti poll tax campaign eventually get rid of the poll tax, and Margaret Thatcher. It also spread into all sorts of other kinds of community-based activities. One of them which I was involved in was trying to stop evictions. Now, that wasn't always that successful, I'm afraid, in my personal experience, but the thing was that it was amazing the number of people that I met in my local area who had never actually been involved in any trade union activity, but were involved in this kind of thing, because it affected them and people they knew personally, and they got, in many cases, really, really, really interested 
not just in that particular issue, but on all attacks, not just in uh, stopping evictions, but we can have been really, really interesting discussions about all sorts of politics, even things like um, troops in Northern Ireland, uh, which was a kind of sensitive thing in Scotland at the time. So anyway, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think exactly what Kate said, possible is for organisation at grassroots level are brilliant, and given the problems a lot of us are going to have in the workplace, which I'm not at the moment, even on indefinite unpaid leave, it's very inspiring. Thanks again. Hi, um, yeah, so I'm Alan, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'd just like to kind of contribute more to the earlier part of the discussion about redundancies um, and how we're fighting them. Um, just talk a little bit about redundancies in the art sector, so in theatres, music venues, art galleries, um, because that's the sector I'm working in. There's about a thousand redundancies just along a small stretch of the Tate, where, uh, a small stretch of the Thames, sorry, uh, with South Bank National Theatre and the Tate. It's mostly low paid jobs that go in, it's disproportionately affecting people of colour. Um, and management are basically arguing it's necessary to make these redundancies because the funding isn't there. Um, and that's kind of the point that unions at the moment here are working around to get those workplaces to put more pressure on the state for financial assistance so that, they, so that redundancies become uh, not necessary. Um, and so, yeah, like it was mentioned, uh, that Tate have balloted successfully for strike action starting on the 18th. Um, and I think just to talk about like the dynamics of how that's gotten moving, um, the P PCS union, which organizes in Tate, um, has like a, spe a specialized kind of culture group and they're really proactive um, more so than kind of like other um, unions in the sector. Um, and there's been a kind of like cross union solidarity network set up um, or like a shop steward combine called the Art Workers Forum. And it's been kind of like a place where reps from different union branches in the same sector can um, pool information um, and kind of like work on supporting one another's sort of protests and actions. Um, and that's been quite helpful in allowing those kind of pro more proactive elements of PCS to bring pressure um, onto other unions in the sector so that we can kind of like um, have a more kind of coordinated response to the mass redundancies. Um, so yeah, I think just kind of, it was mentioned that, you know, we can lean on the state for, um, you know, bailouts. And that's something that we can do in a principled way. And in doing so, it does offer chances to improve trade union, One minute. Trade union consciousness. Um, and, um, you know, from there, I guess, it might be possible to develop a, a more class conscious approach and maybe even recruit people from these efforts into um, RS21, if possible. Yeah, um, I just, with apologies, it's carrying over slightly from the previous session, but hopefully it might be relevant to both. Um, oh, uh, pronouns they and them, by the way. Um, I have been watching recently the uh, Facebook group of nurses and NHS workers that sprung into existence and very quickly gathered about 75,000 members um, a few days ago a couple of weeks ago and which is organizing dozens of protests around the country today as we speak um it's obviously striking that as always when new people move into activity there's a lot of very very sort of um wishful or just sort of unstrategic thinking being expressed on that on that group um so people are spending a lot of energy wondering why the bbc won't give them fair coverage of their radical anti-government action or you know what people saying oh the royal college of nursing union bureaucracy isn't supporting us properly i'm going to defect to unison or or the unison bureaucracy isn't supporting us properly i'm going to defect to the royal college of nursing you know and not kind of having the understanding that the the union bureaucracy are not going to be on side and that you know whichever one you're in it's a matter of working strategically within it um and that, those are just examples and there's also people spreading spreading demoralizing propaganda like oh no you know um that a strike that striking has already failed before it's begun that it's actually sort of criminally illegal in the sense that you'll be imprisoned if you do it or that sort of thing people working essentially on behalf of the, of, of the trade union leadership anyway the point I'm getting at is um, all of this discussion is happening on an open Facebook group that anyone can join and anyone can can stay in it as long as they don't misbehave aggressively. One minute, Max. And that's, sorry? One minute left. Cool. Um, and that's true of a lot of struggles happening at the moment um, to a much greater extent than was the case before 
COVID. Um, so obviously the workforce coronavirus support group gathered, you know, thousands and thousands of people. Lots of major struggles are happening through quite open and anarchic sprawling social media groups and, and spaces. So I think we should regard it as part of our job to actually be intervening on those where we can, uh, much as we're normally you know dismissive of arguing on the internet as a form of political activity i think it actually might make a difference um if if those of us who can um and who feel some kind of connection with specific struggles make the effort to identify online spaces join them and actually have these arguments even if they're circular even if they're constantly repetitive and frustrating um because you know there will be people there who who sympathize with our way of seeing things but that just that needs to be vocalized again and again and a standard kind of put up that that politics uh yeah that's me uh hi john from manchester um he him and i'm also involved in greater manchester law center which gives me a, a, a wish to link the contributions great contributions from will and from kate because i think community charity voluntary sector housing are very much linked and it's not a coincidence the governments have been trying since 1990 effectively to use the voluntary sector as part of the private sector to impose contracting as a method of working and most of all to prevent them from campaigning from advocacy um, and so you've seen housing associations inherit vast waves of council housing their chief executives have big salaries they take business methods on the rents go up um, and effectively the public housing and our demand here should be for more public housing whether council or otherwise I'd be very reluctant to let Manchester Council have their hands on anything at the moment but I, I think there is an argument certainly for much more public housing that we should be demanding um, and certainly we should be demanding an end to that contracting system in terms of providing services but most of all with regard to the I think Kate called it NGOism um, the charities the voluntary organizations that once used to do advocacy and campaigning have become so broadened in number and scope as will was saying how they're handling big um, state contracts but also they've explicitly been told not to campaign and often have taken on charity status in the belief that that means they then can't campaign and that whole level of bureaucracy needs to be challenged and the local examples of that which offer a little bit of hope where we are greater manchester immigration aid unit still fighting deportations rightly linked working with greater manchester law center around access to justice working with tenants unions acorn uh, and so on all of that work i think does need to be encouraged but it has to see the structural point as to how we've got here which is part of government privatization and the voluntary sector isn't wonderful just because it's the voluntary sector it's actually part of that whole process of deregulation and outsourcing which should be combated and we should be arguing therefore for public housing One and minute. for public sector generally i'll finish thanks hi um yeah thank you so much to all the speakers so far it's been um really really excellent um, uh, my name is Charlie, my pronouns are she, her, I'm in RS21 East London um, and yeah, I'm, I've been active in the London Renters Union since March when we started setting up a branch in Tower Hamlets um, and there's a couple of things I want to say. The first one is that I think something which is going to be really crucial um, if we want to start making significant impacts is, is, is building strong links between renters organizing and workers organizing and I know that's that's already been raised a couple of times um, but I think one of the problems with it is that so the most apparent routes to doing that are things like you know having tenants unions join trades councils in the area and you know making making formal relationships with um, levels of trade union bureaucracy at least that's what's been mainly floated within London renters union and I, I think that really um, misses out opportunities for like rank and file uh links between um you know between workers and trade unions and and um renters organizing which i think is really what we need to be finding ways um strategies to do um i think in tower hamlets we've been trying to do a lot of organizing around the the big council worker strike which has another wave of strike days starting this thursday um so support that if you can um and I think things like that are going to be really important, trying to build like direct on the ground links. Um, conscious of time, so I just quickly want to talk about rent debt as well. Um, 
because I think people are talking, and the, this is a problem, I think the renters unions are talking a lot about evictions crisis and homelessness crisis, but not that much about rent debt crisis more broadly. Um, in July, we found that 590,000 um, individuals and households are in debt to their landlord um, since the coronavirus pandemic, and that debt is only going to continue mounting, um, which means that it, it's going to be a crisis as Kate... Yeah, one pointed, minute, Charlie. Thank you. It's going to be a crisis, as, as Kate um, pointed out, that is, that, that is going to have very far-reaching consequences. Um, and yeah, I absolutely think we need to be organising around debt as well as unemployment. Hi, um, yeah, I just wanted to um, say something quick about, um, like people have mentioned um, Black Lives Matter, but I think um, that that movement um, shouldn't be seen as being sort of outside of particularly community organizing. Um, so for instance, at the moment, like today, um, there's a demo in Tottenham outside the police station uh, against over-policing. And that is very much like a community mobilization. Um, and just yesterday, I don't know if everyone would have heard about it, um, the cops, like they arrested a 14 year old boy in Collindale and then some young people went to a youth project called the Forefront Project to tell the youth workers there about it. The police then I think raided the offices. I might be wrong about the detail of this, but as I understand it, the police then raided the offices and arrested some of the staff and more young people um, very violently. And then there was um, a kind of uh, spontaneous protest outside the police station um, and so, yeah, I mean, basically what I'm getting at is that I think when we think about community organizing, um, policing has to be, policing and eviction resistance has to be part of the picture as well, um, because that is, yeah, like obviously felt extremely keenly and it's really important for kind of, um, and I think in terms of like the points Kate made about it's hard to politicize stuff, when you raise um, police harassment, police violence as issues in a community organizing space, that is kind of, you know, it's it's like, okay, this is something we need to address and it also politicizes that space. So I just, I think that that's, yeah, something to kind of um, weave through uh, when we're talking about community organizing. Um, yeah, I posted the link to the Facebook event. So um, on the 22nd, which is the day before the eviction ban is lifted, we've got protests outside the county court. Now I just decided this because I felt like we needed to have a protest in Cambridge because we haven't done one for a while. Um, but actually, Acorn had the same idea, which is like great months think I can shit like that. Um, but it's the thing about I live in Cambridge, and Cambridge is ludicrously expensive. It's like people are routinely paying two thirds of their wages in in rents because private sector rents are so high, and houses are even more unaffordable. So the, the uh, although Cambridge is not going to be massively hit by the downturn by the recession because our, our tech sector bubble is kind of very insulated. Those guys are just unsack un unfireable at the moment until something really bad happens with TikTok. Um, so they're going to be okay, but there's a large set of proportion of people who aren't involved in the tech sector who are accruing rent arrears, and it could be disastrous. Now, I was at my local Romsey uh, Labour Party ward meeting in Cambridge, where I put my motion to them, they backed it unanimously, they sent it forward to the city-wide constituents Labour Party. That's going to be done on the nod, it's going to be the first decision they're going to make since the decision bound was lifted by um, the uh, Labour NEC yesterday or the day before. Uh, it's going to my union branch meeting on Monday. I'm putting it at uh, the union branches across the city. Um, so, but it's not just the protest. The, the protest is the first stage of the campaign. So the protest is the day before the eviction ban gets lifted. We're also sending, we're going to have what we officially call a court reporter. We are going to pay people if necessary to stalk them, to stand outside the county court all day long while eviction proceedings are ongoing to make sure they talk to everyone who is under threat of eviction and going into the courts, their lawyers, and everywhere else involved in the process. I'm getting the city council to write to all the landlords, uh, the letting agencies and stuff, explaining that the city council is completely opposed to you turfing out with people onto the streets in the middle of a global pandemic, and also to the debt collectors and bailiffs who are licensed to operate in the city. So if uh, thugs are us or licensed by Cambridge City Council, then thugs are us gonna get a letter from the city council saying, stop being such bastards. You need to act with some civility and actually behave as human beings. One minute, Ozzy. Yeah, and it explains them under no uncertain terms. I plan on putting a ton of humanity in between bailiffs and front doors, and that involves 18 people as fat as me, who when we sit down are incredibly difficult to move, and they need to accept this fact. There are going to be no easy evictions in Cambridge, and that's where Acorn come into it. Now, I, sometimes I think everyone's trying to reinvent the wheel. It's still going to be round. We've got a good United Community branch in Cambridge, and Acorn have come into the city as well, and I welcome their arrival. And their tactics are very useful, and they're doing the hard work on the training of activists to resist, resist evictions. 
so the trade union movement can play a part. But I think ACORN is a very, very useful tool which should support it wherever it comes into existence. I'm done. Yeah, I'll chop this out a bit at the end because I think there's a couple of relevant things to come back on there. So um, one of them I wanted to point out was uh, there's a lot more. I didn't really, I didn't do it justice earlier, really, about everything that's being done <laughs> and that you can get involved in. So I encourage people to go and search for that. But Corn is doing a national day of action everywhere where it is, which is a lot of cities. So there's a lot of, it's mostly in cities, but it's also in some towns outside cities. So it's not... Um, solely in cities but if you look up your localist acorn branch on their website um one of the things they're doing is um serving eviction resistance notices to all the estate agents um basically going if you if you are going to try anything then we're watching you um and to try and get them to um stumble their way on camera into saying that they're not going to participate in um things for landlords which we obviously know that they, they will later but you know um, tactics, you know, <laughs> to try and get them to put pressure on them. Um, and then I think um, I wanted to come back on Taze's point about um, the police. I think when evictions are illegal, of which there are lots every year, but when they are illegal, obviously the tenant can call the police and the police sometimes bother to stop it and sometimes don't. But most of the time the police will be on the side of the landlord. Most of the time, if you stand outside the house and um, you try and stop it of an eviction happening, the police can be called to help enforce that legal eviction. So um, I think we have to do resist, um, talk about the it not being the police's place to get involved in this, this stuff and the kind of narrowing of the police's remit um, with the goal of eventually getting rid of them um, as part of that struggle. So um, as part of the, the, to try and help that resistance. And finally, I just wanted to mention the, um, a uh, campaign from Shelter uh, that, well, it was a campaign of Acorn Shelter, London Renters Union, and quite a lot of people about two One years minute. ago, about two years ago, um, called the Ye Yes to DSS campaign, because there was a massive uh, spike in a landlord saying they wouldn't accept benefits claimants um, with a no DSS policy, um, which led to a lot of homelessness. And because of that, it didn't win outright at the time, but it was a lot of positive noise in the media. And Shelter actually ended up taking a court case um, which has now been won to say that um, saying no to DSS is, is discriminatory and illegal and so covered by discrimination law. Um, so actually, just in time for the next wave of homelessness, there has been an, an ongoing win from the past that will help make arguments that people who are now newly on universal credit shouldn't be um, turfed out of housing or told they can't move anywhere else. So that's really good. And I think it's testament to the groundwork that campaigns put in um, over a longer period of time. So even if it doesn't look like you win tomorrow, you might win in three or four years time. And that's something to bear in mind when you're organizing and feeling a bit hopeless. Um, it's, may, it's just a question really uh, to Kate or anyone else who knows, but um, as I had understood it, a lot of eviction resistance work, basically, if it's successful, the eviction, the eviction is stopped, but it doesn't, obviously mean that the, the residents have a way of staying there sustainably on a long-term basis. It often means they might get a few weeks or, you know, kind of be able to find somewhere else on their own pace. But I guess I just, I wonder if um, you can say a bit more about whether there are long-term strategies land landlords can use over months, like if they can get utilities cut off or whatever um, to force people out and if there are, if there are ways for us to actually um, not just resist evictions on the day, but take over housing and spaces um, in a way that people can actually live securely in them. You know, people who are raising families or, or for whatever reason just can't can't be dealing with the kind of precarity that living in a, a squat normally entails, uh, for example. Yeah, I just wanted to come back in in response to what people were saying about unions. Um, and there is a problem here, um, a significant problem. You know, I'm thinking back to, and somebody posted about it, Unison telling their members not to go on the NHS worker protest today. Um, and the discussion that we actually had around this on um, the Unite Redundancy training that I attended last week 
or this week. Um, very good tutor, um, one of the better tutors. I actually asked us all to give our views on how Unite can do more to help people facing redundancy. Um, and I basically said, well, you know, it's, it's a service model and we need to change away from that service model to an organising model. Unite officers will mostly take somebody through the legal basis basics of what um, that individual is going through so they'll kind of look at the legal pitfalls but nothing beyond that um, mostly because a lot of them don't have an organizing background and I actually think every single Unite officer should go on a five week five day course five weeks maybe on organizing um, <laughs> yeah five weeks probably isn't long enough for some of them um, and you know it's just that expectation that we have that there will be at least some fight for our jobs um, and it's not just about the individual members who need support I'm an experienced rep in a workplace with about 40 50 members I don't need my officer to say right this is what is going to happen because I know what is going to happen what I need my officer to say is right you've told me x y z you can challenge that for example one of the things for redundancies and yeah, one minute nicola thanks the acas best practice is minimizing redundancies so the employer having to take every single opportunity to minimize compulsory redundancies we need to fight against that um, because they're not um, and also where the work has not diminished or disappeared and is actually being outsourced to third parties, the private sector. Uh, that is also a reason to challenge redundancies because the work hasn't diminished or disappeared and in law, it really has to. Um, and you know that is really really demoralizing for a lot of us who are fighting for our jobs at the moment um and actually you know the nhs protests are a perfect example of the rank and file coming up because unions have not done it very much for us in the public sector it's now you wind up, um, okay. activists it's now the rank and file who are actually organizing to fight back against it same in local government as well Hi. Um, when the lockdown um, happened in Leicester, the first sort of localised lockdown, um, a lot of the focus was put on um, the, te uh, the textile industry and the um, sweatshops as being uh, the cause, uh, people being forced to continue working uh, in um, unsafe conditions. Um, and uh, arising out of that, there has been a, the beginnings of an attempt to have a campaign uh, that the Trades Council is involved with and the Council and um, various, various um, uh, of the regional trade unions as well. Um, it's, um, in many ways it's very, you know, it's a very positive campaign. Um, the, but, the, the focus is, is very much from above, uh, trying to create a situation in which um, the brands insist that there's recognition in, in, in workplaces and all that sort of thing, which if you've not got members in the workplaces, isn't that relevant. And, and it's also in a, an area in which um, it's, it lends itself very much to community organizing because uh, you know, we are talking about pe you know, people who potentially are, um, uh, who are working in, in, those, in, in those workplaces who are may be doing so um, without legal cover, uh, without, uh, without, uh, you know, uh, it may be seeking asylum, maybe, you know, also all, all sorts of, all sorts of issues where they 
will feel um one minute mike where, where they where, where they won't feel that they can take a leaflet from somebody immediately outside their workplace what we're actually looking uh looking to say we should do is start doing door-to-door -door work in the areas around these uh, the, the these these things and look to you know do it as community organizing in order to generate workplace organizing um, i'm just going to direct answer max's question um which was a question around um the eviction being just like delaying the inevitable um and what i wanted to say was i do think it's really important that um we don't focus on the eviction itself as the whole of the of what you're trying to resist because of that exact problem once you've got to the court door once that what's that's been issued um there's a kind of there's more enforcement power that they have to then make that happen however if you can get it before that point and usually the eviction process is quite long so you don't just get an eviction the week after you issue one you have to issue the notice give them two months wait for them to get out the property sort out any kind of logistics and admin in the interim and then go to court which might be delayed because of the numbers of people going to court so you have a several month process in the middle during which time you can pressure the landlord force the landlord's hand a little bit negotiate and then it's the resistance so the, the last thing that you want to be doing really is doing an eviction resistance for everyone on the day um, and you might actually be able to get much better outcomes and much better terms if you start earlier and people know they can approach you in advance of that eviction um, it's, I'd also um, bring that up in relation to Ozzy's point about um, standing outside the courts I think that sounds very valid but needs to bear that that other bit in mind about the fact that when you're outside the court you probably already have but when you're outside the court you're um, already quite far on in that process and um, just to answer the second question of Max's um, my understanding is that utilities are separate from estate agents and landlords um, so the um, I don't know if if, they're, if they can apply to courts or anything to muddle the two together but my understanding is even if you're squatting you can get water and electricity as long as somebody in that property is paying a bill so um, so yeah, I, I don't think that there are tactics they can use against you. Um, but to be honest, that one I don't think is one, and, and that would be a particularly horrible one. But the energy companies just respond to you. Separately. Yeah, one minute, Kate. That's it. Yeah. So I'm going to call back in each of the speakers in turn to try and sum up and respond to some of the discussion. So I'm going to start off in the order they spoke in. So I'm going to start with Will, if that's okay. Um, I think yeah, it's been an excellent discussion. Um, I think. Yeah, like some of the, some of what came out obviously was about kind of um, uh, which kind of unions have been better on certain things and that kind of thing. I think you know obviously that's an important point when we're talking about bureaucracy, but I think as well it's really important to kind of bear in mind that you know you can do a lot without you know you, you can never ignore the bureaucracy, but actually it's often quite immaterial which union you're in when you're um, starting from scratch. Um, and actually, these things can come down to what's kind of like what's best for your workplace. And this is one of the things that as soon as you start having union meetings, that kind of thing in the workplace, that's the kind of arena where you can start to use that as a barometer to work out kind of what the atmosphere is like, what kind of how people respond and that kind of thing. Because, you know, some of the things that, you know, we might think would be common sense to say as socialists won't resonate with people in the office and others, other things will. Um, and so I suppose, yeah, just tempering whatever general lessons kind of we take from this. It's also just, you know, there's no, um, no, um, uh, no alternative to actually just, you know, trying it and seeing. Yeah, there's a lot there, isn't it? And I think that what we'll probably have to do and probably throw it back to the steam group or to, to Ian is to try and figure out a, an article or a, or a comment. Uh, on the web page and whatever that kind of draw, tries to draw some of the stuff because historically there, there's been recessions before if you look in the 1930s uh, the, the occupations or the car plants uh, and other places where workers were being threatened uh, with mass redundancies and whatever in every workplace we need to fight because we don't know if that's the workplace that can be generalized and make a difference to your local area or even nationally. Nobody would know when, when there's an occupation in, in, in Fab, in Fab or Holland and Wolf or in the past, 
um, the car plants and the rest. Nobody knew, ah, this is going to go residue, uh, resonate all the way through history that we did it. And now people are using our example. Nobody goes into a fight thinking that they're going to be uh, that's so historically important. So it's really, it's really key that we also generalize out. So for instance, the, the 12,000 um, workers that are threatened with 50% or some of them 50%, others with different percentages or cuts in their terms, uh, in terms and conditions in British Airways, we have to look and say, oh, they're the, in the industry that we want to see closed down. Therefore, we'll no fight. That would be wrong. If we look back in history, we look back to the to the Clyde Shop Stewards Committee and the and the struggle and the big rent uh, uh, victories that were achieved then in the First World War that actually formed the basis of um, rent legislation today. That was a huge victory. What were they doing uh, when they were in there in these shipyards? But building what? Building uh, warships for the First World War which was an imperialist war. So those people, that, that split consciousness in, the, in there working, building sh ships, but actually they were hugely anti-war. All the, the Clyde Shop Shoes Committees, you know, with a, with a trade union sometimes, uh, with a rank and file, always. Those things that we as socialists in our history recognize were started and we can be part of that. We don't know who, who's going to be the most uh, crucial individual. You know, Rosa Parks, how did she know that she was going to sit down that day and, <laughs> and explode the whole civil rights? From individual small subjective factors, things can different, can be made different. And I think that what we've got to do is to understand we have to be with the British Airways workers. At the same time, we have to have a delicate what, what, One what minute, Willie. Really. Yeah, what is the argument about a picket line? On a picket line, when the scabs come, we all unite. When the scabs go away, we have the political discussion. These are the, these are the ingredients that we have to have. So British Airways workers will recognise that a, a planet, we need jobs, isn't worth a, a, a souk. So I think that what we need to do is to link up um, where we are. In terms of Leicester, that's a difficult one. We used to argue we're with the bosses when they're atta racially attacked, but we're also against them when they exploit their workers. Now, that's a delicate thing. And I think in Leicester, that's the fight. We need to be clear that we are no racially against uh, the bosses that are exploiting those workers if they happen to be Asian or whatever but we are ag against them being uh, racially attacked and we will unite with them um, uh, and try and make some, some difference. So I think that it's... Good to start working up, yeah. Really. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's lots of things to do and I would suggest that the steering committee uh, needs to encourage link up between people that are, say, in the, the tenants movement uh, and we should have a discussion. We probably... Uh, that's already happening probably and I'm just out the, out the loop but we need to find those ways of supporting each other but also looking out to what we do matters in this real world every comrade in the, uh, in the RS21 matters uh, in the here and now and we can make a huge difference uh, if we're fast on our feet A last little thing that I would say uh, I know I've spoken quite a bit but um, the final thing would be around um around the division that uh, Nicola brought up earlier around the service union and the, uh, the union that's the fighting union, the rank and file union. And I think um, what I would encourage people to do is not to, in a time when the tenants unions are doing very well, um, not to drift into seeing them as the ones that can do it, because the reason that the tenants unions can do it is because they've created some quite basic scalable tactics. Um, and so even though we can learn lessons from how it's done and like the well, the, the good things, that shouldn't make us blind to the things we disagree with about their approaches or things we maybe would critique if we were involved. Um, and so you, there, are, there are tactics in there that you can all use yourselves, whether you're facing um, eviction, repossession, debt. Um, 
these are active creative activist tactics direct action tactics and lobbying tactics those those are what they are there's campaigning and there's direct action in there um, and you can do that yourselves even with a small group of people you can win your own fights through there is people power which joining the unions helps with um, but even creating your own small thing it, I, I don't want to get to the point where we kind of as the media often do lionize one or two tenants unions and they end up drifting into a servicing model where you feel like you can't do it yourselves unless you call them um, you can and we should um, and it's the same for workplace organizing isn't it it's the same for um, the power is in us it's in people power but it's also in each of us to to bring that all together and fight for ourselves um, and yeah I hope that we can do that and that um, we can be part of the rank and file end of these movements that is that is winning